That looks much better to me. So, um, this is uh, this is uh, discussion uh, 16. Um, please take attendance quiz 16 if you've not uh, done that already. Um, what did you find interesting from the homework? Uh, I do apologize for the confusion about where to upload uh, your homework. I think I've put the numbers now. The numbers will correspond with uh, where you're to upload. I found a lot interesting uh, in this, and we're going to look today uh, at Jesus as the servant king, as the perfect embodiment uh, of love. We're going to look at Judas and Jesus and like what's going on with uh, what the Bible has to say about Judas. We're going to look at Jesus and the unity uh, he has with God. And then lastly, we're going to begin to get into this difficult subject of predestination, election, and how that relates to human responsibility for actions. With God's help, uh, we'll look at all of these. So Jesus as the servant king and perfect love 13.3 says this, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from uh, God and was going back to God, he rose from the supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. In other words, Jesus is doing um, something that only servants would be required to do. This is not something a king would ever have done. Uh, but Jesus is doing it. And um, the amazing thing is that this probably looks back to a strange passage uh, in the Old Testament in Zechariah 3.1. And there we have a, a figure who's a high priest that's called Joshua. And remind me again what uh, the word Joshua is in Greek. Yeshua, and so it's actually the word Jesus. So the actual Greek word uh, is the same exact name, uh, Yeshua and Iesus in Greek. And so Zechariah has this vision of a high priest named Joshua, and he was standing before the angel of the Lord. And then the text says, uh, the Satan, or Hadiabolos, uh, the accuser was standing there at his right hand to satan him, to accuse him. And so the priest is there, and this uh, figure, this mysterious figure, Hasatan, the Diabolos, uh, was there and is accusing um, the high priest. And then the text says this, and notice in uh, uh, Greek, uh, Jesus, having been clothed with clothes um, of filth. So the picture there is this high priest, but instead of having pure uh, clothes, he's covered with filth. And so you might think of Jesus as being clothed with the uh, towel. He's kind of looking like this figure looked in the Old Testament. Um, what's interesting about this filthy clothes is uh, this word in Hebrew is really a strange word because it, it's actually the word excrement. Um, so this figure in uh, uh, Zechariah 3 is of the high priest who should be in these glorious clothes and instead... Uh, He's bearing the sin of his people, and he's covered with filthy clothes. And so Jesus, in washing the disciples' feet, may be echoing uh, this because as uh, their dirtiness comes off, their dirtiness comes on to uh, Jesus. Um, and Jesus says, If then uh, I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. And there are uh, some 
uh, denominations who view this as a sacrament, and uh, I can't argue against them. I, I don't believe it's being presented as a sacrament, but I understand why uh, denominations will do that. But I think all denominations, all Christians should look at this as um, Jesus washed our feet. Jesus helped uh, uh, make us presentable to God, and that's how we should look at our relationship with uh, other people, that we're uh, all about uh, helping other people in their relationship with God. Well, how do you do that? How do you do that when just somebody is being an absolute jerk to you? And I, I, when I say somebody there, I mean a Christian. Um, how do you love somebody when over and over and over again they're um, responding to you in a, a bad way uh, Jesus knew, Jesus knew the answer to that, and he said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much proof, for apart from me, you are able to do nothing. You can't do this unless you're connected uh, to Jesus and the uh, power of uh, Jesus' life and the love of Jesus' heart. Uh, John 3.35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. I like what the New Living Translation, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. This is the last conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples, and, and this is uh, one of the most important parts. He says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another, in Greek, uh, the way this is written, uh, you could translate it that you constantly love one another. And of course, you can probably see that that's the word agape. In order that you agape, uh, just as I have agape you, I want you to agape uh, other uh, people, one, one another. Uh, also in this passage, uh, God gives us a glorious promise. Um, let me ask you this. How many of you um, in here are extroverts, would classify yourself as an expert? Very good. Uh, it's wonderful to be around extroverts, isn't it? Uh, um, just uh, people who've never met a stranger. Uh, my oldest son is like that. He, uh, From the time he was an infant, he could not be alone. He loves being with people. Uh, he's on the absolute uh, extreme of extroversion. Uh, how many of you are introverts? Um, and uh, like uh, you can do that, uh, you know, kind of visiting people in a room, but after two hours, what happens uh, if you're, in, it's like, let me go find a corner, you know, and kind of recharge for six hours. Okay. And uh, are either of those good or bad? Or do they both reflect the image of God who is, after all, he's the ultimate extrovert and he's the ultimate introvert. Uh, he's an introvert and extrovert at the same time. I love this passage because in Greek, uh, it says, in my father's house are many alone places. So in some of the older translations, it says, uh, uh, many mansions, and the ESV says many rooms, but the literal translations, you can see it's the word monos, so uh, individual rooms. Uh, if that were not so, would I have said that I'm going to prepare a place for you? This image is um, a marriage image. Uh, in the culture, um, you would... Uh, you would have a household estate and you would just add to that um, rooms. And then uh, when you were ready to marry, you would go get your bride and bring her home. And that's the image that's being uh, shown here. Uh, there are many alone places. And if that weren't true, I wouldn't have said that I'm preparing a place for you. Uh, we also have... Um, a narrow but a very grace-filled way. Uh, look, look at this verse. Uh, Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father 
except through me. If we listen to the wider culture, um, the wider culture would say that all religions are paths up the same mountain they meet at the top. You uh, choose the path that you need to choose, but they'll all get you uh, to the same place at the top. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said if you want to have a relationship with the Father, there's one way, and it's a way open to anybody, uh, a way that uh, has signs on it, whosoever will may come, uh, a way that says Jesus died so that anyone who repents of their sins and believes will be saved. Uh, that's the way, but it's a narrow way because it says that's the only way to the Father. There aren't other ways. There, uh, all religions aren't the same path up to the same mountain. Uh, there's one path, and Jesus says that he is that way. And then he goes on to say, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And that's very interesting because today, a lot of people in churches are saying, God's grace is so great that just continue in your sin. Just continue in your sin and you'll be saved. It'd be totally uh, great. You know, don't, if you're struggling with sin, don't worry about praying. Uh, Jesus died for all your sins. Just don't worry about it. Uh, you'll be okay. And Jesus said the exact opposite. He said, if you love me, you'll, you'll keep my commandments. So when someone says you don't have to keep commandments, uh, what they're telling you is you don't have to love Jesus. And uh, there is an element of truth that Je- and a great element of truth that Jesus died for all our sins and it isn't obey and then you're saved. But when someone says you don't have to care at all uh, about what you're uh, doing, just live however you want and, and it'll be okay, that's not going with this verse. Uh, this verse says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And then you start thinking about uh, your track record there and it's like, man, I'm not very good about keeping Uh, God's commandments and I think there's where Jesus promise is apart from me you can do nothing will come into play we can't do this on our own but Jesus can give us the ability to do it Jesus says whoever has my commandments and keeps them he it is who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and notice in the original all these words are agape uh, the the one having my commandments and keeping, that is the one agapeing me, and the one agapeing me will be agaped by my Father, and I will agape him, and I will disclose myself to him. There's a glorious promise um, when we look to Jesus and seek to take faltering, uh, stumbling steps in obedience. Jesus has a magnificent promise that if we do that, Uh, And he adds, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him. And then look at this. Uh, We will come and we will make the alone place with him. Uh, We will make, I mean, have you ever been to like uh, your family house and like there's a man cave or I don't know, do they have woman caves too? I suppose they do. Places where just the perfect uh, place to hang out, spend time. Um, Jesus is saying that God has an alone place and that if, if you're willing to follow God's way, that God will make his alone place with you. Uh, that you will be included in that alone place. What what a magnificent uh, promise. All right, well, we want to ask, uh, what about Judas? This passage has a lot to say about Judas. What should we think about Judas? Well, um, we should think this, that Jesus knew Judas was going to betray him from the very beginning. Um, when 
uh, Jesus called Judas and gave him every opportunity and begged him to repent and uh, interacted with him, to, uh, was his friend, Jesus knew that he was going to betray. He knew from the very beginning. And I don't know if you've ever picked this up in this story, uh, but it says during the supper, the devil, and notice it's that same uh, thing from um, uh, Zechariah 3 3, ha diabolos, the slanderer, uh, the accuser. The accuser had already thrown into the heart of uh, Judas in order that Judas would hand him over. Now, do you see this word Judas here? Eudas. You see that? If we look that up in the Bible, I think the first use of that word would be here. Eudas. You see that? That's if we looked up this word. If we looked up this word, Eudas, this is what it would pull up as the first reference. And how's it being translated? Judah. You see, it's the same exact word, right? It's spelled exactly the same way. Um, Judas is the word Judah. Now help me with that. What can you tell me about Judah in the Old Testament? He had a really righteous brother named Joseph and they were going to kill him. They were going to kill their brother. Now, who in the story was killed by their brother? It's a Cain and Abel story. So the brothers of Jacob are doing what Cain did because their brother, Joseph, was righteous. He lived a righteous life and they hated him. Um, uh, his father loved him because he obeyed his father's commandments and the brothers hated him. So so we'll fix this, we'll kill him. And Judah comes along and says, well, you know, if we kill him, we won't get any money, so maybe we should just sell him. And so that's what they do. They uh, strip him naked. You know anybody else in this story gets stripped naked? And then they throw him in a pit. And they said, we'll see what becomes of this dreamer. It's interesting. What we know about uh, Judah, if we compare Judah and Joseph, um, the Old Testament says you shall not uncover the nakedness of your daughter-in-law. She is your son's wife. She, you shall not uncover her nakedness. You know, I don't know if you ever read the Bible and come across a law and say to yourself, well, that's pretty obvious, you know, don't, like, you know, <laughs> there's some things you just don't do, you know. Uh, don't sleep with animals, you know. It's like, did you really have to, say that and like in the midst of those laws it says hey don't sleep with your uh, darn law guess what Judah had done he slept with his daughter-in-law and his excuse was well I thought she was a cult prostitute oh my goodness that makes it totally okay as long as you thought she was a cult prostitute for a while I you know, I thought you might have been a bad person, but as long as you thought she was a fertility cult prostitute, everything is okay. Judah is a scoundrel of a person. He slept with his own daughter-in-law. She pretended to be a cult prostitute. And he says, and I don't know if you remember this story, but he almost kills her when she comes up pregnant because, you know, like she's she's been sleeping around. we got to kill her. And 
the normal way, you know, if somebody fornicates, you stone them. But if you're the high priest, uh, the high priest's daughter is burned if she fornicates. And Judah is saying, hey, I'm a religious person. We, we can't just stone her. We've got to burn her. It's like, really? I mean, help me here, Judah. Wasn't it like three months ago you're sleeping with the fertility cult prostitute and and like total hypocrite? That's who Judah is. He's the one who comes up with, let's sell Joseph. And you think about Joseph's life. I mean, what are his sexual ethics? I mean, the woman's grabbing his clothes, sleep with me, sleep with me. And he says, no, it would be wrong. And finally, she rips his clothes off and he runs out. And then she accuses him of rape and he gets thrown in prison. And that's how he's able to deliver his brothers. You meant it for evil, God meant it for good. Is that story oddly similar to what's going on in the Jesus story? You've got the lives of sinful people and then you compare that with the life of Jesus. Jesus is, oh, uh, he's kind of like the ultimate son of Joseph. Um, Only he's really the son of God. How are they alike? Uh, uh, Judas and Judah both sell uh, a righteous person. Um, Judah in the Old Testament sells Joseph for 20 shekels and the reason they do that because Joseph is 17 years old and that's how much a 17 year old was uh, worth according to the uh, chart of the valuation um, if someone made an oath uh, to God how much they had to pay per how old they were 20 shekels about four thousand dollars or maybe a little more than that Uh, Joseph is 17 years old when he's sold into captivity. He's 30 when he's exalted to rule. Judah in the New Testament um, says, what will you give to me if if I hand Jesus over? And they said, we'll give you 30 shekels. Now, how many of you have heard people say the Bible is anti-woman? How many of you have heard that? Like Richard Dawkins, oh, the Bible's so anti-woman, you know, devalued women. Okay, one of the um, verses they're going to try to pass off in that narrative is this verse, because um, 30 pieces of silver is the uh, valuation of a woman in the Old Testament. So um, uh, the valuation of a male from 20 years old to 60 will be 50 shekels of silver. So um, Jesus was uh, 30, um, 33 years old when he died. And so according to that uh, vow uh, chart in the Old Testament, um, he should have been worth about $10,000. But notice it says if the person is a female, the valuation is 30 shekels. And maybe they're doing that because in that culture, um, the men fought in wars uh, who were that old uh, and the women did not. Uh, We don't really know why they're valuing it like that, but they say, oh, the Bible's anti-woman. That same 30 uh, shekels is mentioned that if you have a slave who dies, um, uh, the person has to pay 30 shekels. And I think God, I I imagine you see that the reason the high priests are offering 30 shekels is because they're saying of Jesus, he's not really a man. We won't give you a man's price. We'll give you a woman's price or, or a slave's price. We'll not give you the value of a a man, and so that's what they give Judas. But if you think about the meta narrative, what is Jesus giving his life as a ransom for? He's giving his life as a ransom for one glorious woman who's enslaved to sin. 
and when he uh, dies, he is ransoming her. They mean it as an insult to Jesus, and God means it as the meta narrative elegant price of the Empress of the universe. Uh, they meant it for evil, God meant it uh, for good. Uh, Judas and Judah are the same exact word, and so we're meant to read these two stories together. In uh, the closing bit of this talk, we want to talk about Jesus and the unity of God. And in the Old Testament, you have uh, phrases like, I am God and there is no other. Isaiah 45, 23 uh, is part of that passage. But notice what um, Jesus says. Jesus says, when Jesus has spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has uh, come, glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished what you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I manifested your name uh, to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Uh, yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from me, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you and have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world. I am praying for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, your name which you have given me. This passage says that God the Father has given Jesus his name. That same idea appears in Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name, the one that is above every name. Now, if you were a Jewish person, what would the name, the one above every name, be to you as a Jew? Is there a name that you treat more special than the other names? The name of God, uh, God's very own name, Y-H-W-H in the Old Testament. Um, well, some people say, well, it says God hyper-exalted him. That means he was lower and God made him higher than he was. Well, that's not true. Uh, the word hyper-exalted is this word hooper upsao and this is where it's used in the Old Testament. For you, O Lord, are huper upsaod uh, over all uh, gods. Or here, Daniel uh, 3, uh, 52. Blessed are you, O Lord, God of our ancestors. You are to be praised and huper upsaod forever. Or Daniel four thirty four. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, huper upsao and extol and honor the king of heaven. So when it says that God, huper upsao, Jesus, it's not saying he was lower and God made him higher. Rather, this passage is talking about God giving the name above every name. And this is God's own name, YHWH. God has given uh, the name YHWH to Jesus. Well, what's amazing about that is YHWH says, I don't share my glory with anybody. I, I alone in the Lord. Um, it's interesting. I, I was able to write a doctoral dissertation on this. I think our library has it. Um, I meant to bring the book in to show it, but I forgot. Um, but, uh, this is arguing this same point that 
uh, Philippians 2.9 is saying that this is being applied to Jesus, and we see the same thing was said in John uh, 17. There are all kinds of passages that do this in the New Testament. It will come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, who uh, call uh, epikaleo ta anima kuriu, but notice in the Old Testament, it's will call on the name of YHWH. That's applied to Jesus all through the New Testament. And even monotheistic language is applied to Jesus. Um, if we look at Isaiah 42 through 49, you have these statements, I am God and there is no other. I don't share my glory. There is no one who's a savior beside me. Turn to me and be saved, for I am the Lord. There is no other. I have sworn from my mouth has gone th- out righteousness that shall not re- return to me. Every knee will bow and every tongue swear allegiance. And you look at all these verses and they're saying the exact same thing, that God is the only one. He doesn't share his glory with anyone. And then it, in that passage, he says, uh, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Well, if you compare Philippians 2, 10, and 11 with Isaiah 45, 23, this is what you get. And uh, um, you don't even have to be able to read Greek to see that these words are the same, every knee. Uh, you don't have to read Greek to realize that the top one uh, says every knee should bow and 50, 45, 23 says every knee will bow. And you don't have to read Greek to know that that says every tongue, pasa glossa, and will ex homo legacetai. So yes, they're out of order, but Paul is quoting from memory here, and he's quoting Isaiah 45, 23. And 45, 22 had just said, I am Yahweh and there is no other. To me, every knee will bow. Uh, Jesus says in this same vein, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the father. Jesus said to him, I've been with you so long and you do not know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the father. Remember in John 1, is it 1? 14, I think, says no one has ever seen God any time. The only begotten who is in the bosom of the Father, he has exegeted him. This is that same word. So we've seen uh, this idea of Judas and Jesus. We've seen Jesus in the unity of God. And in the 10 minutes we have left, we're going to start to look at this really difficult thing about predestination because Jesus has a lot to say about predestination in our passage. Uh, John 13, 18, I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate bread has lifted up his heel against me. Uh, Jesus says, I know whom I have chosen. And this word in Greek is from ek lego. Uh, ek lego is where we get the word elect from. Uh, it means to pick out. That's what it literally means. And so Jesus says, I know the ones I have picked out. Uh, Jesus says, you did not pick me out. And notice this is the same word but I eclegoed you, I picked you out that you should go and bear much fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give to you. Now, that's a strange thing for Jesus to say. You did not choose me. You did not elect me. I elected you. Because after all, these people responded. They left everything. Jesus said, come follow me. They Uh, left the boat, they left the net, they left the father, they left the hired uh, hands. Uh, And Jesus is saying, you didn't pick me, I picked you. 
that's kind of an amazing statement. Uh, so what exactly does it mean? Well, uh, Jesus doesn't shy away from this idea in the Bible. Uh, in his high priestly prayer, he says, since you have given him over all authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. God the Father gave the Son a group of people, and Jesus said, um, I want those people to be saved, so he prays in their behalf. John 6, 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me hell kuos him. Uh, and we saw that that's the word drag. When Paul's dragged out of the temple into the fortress Antonio, he's hell kuoed. And Jesus said, nobody comes to uh, the Father, no one comes to me unless the Father hell kuos him. John 17, 9 says, I am praying for them. Jesus says, I'm not praying for the people in the world. I'm not praying for the people in the world. I'm praying for the group that you have given me. That's a stunning statement. And when we think about that, we have to affirm everything the Bible teaches, and the Bible also affirms this. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned. So Jesus is uh, taking this pretty hard line about, you know, picking and God choosing and, and you didn't choose me. And at the same time, he's affirming whosoever will may come. So if we want to be under the Bible and not over the Bible, we've got to come up with a way to affirm both those truths. That it's a real offer made to everyone, and if you come, you will be saved. The Bible teaches that. It doesn't say, as long as you're elect, you'll be saved. It says, if you come, you will be saved. But at the same time, it has these, you didn't pick me, I picked you. And so whatever the Bible is teaching, it's not teaching fatalism. Oh, you can choose to repent of your sins and believe all you want, but if you're not elect, you're going to go to hell. The Bible does not teach that. That's a view called hyper-Calvinism, and it's wrong. But the Bible doesn't teach, on the other hand, uh, oh, God only elects those he foresees will believe. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that if you believe, you'll be saved, but that somehow that is being connected with, with Jesus picking and choosing. The ball's always in your court. Uh, the people who perish are going to be the people who refuse the offer. But the Bible is saying something uh, about uh, God's choice. And so what we have to do is we have to come to the text and say, okay, I want to believe exactly what the Bible says, but what exactly is it saying? And we're going to look at that, particularly uh, when we look at the book of Romans. Uh, the Bible says, uh, this is a beautiful verse because it takes the ultimate kind of free will verse, but to all who did receive him who believed, he gave the right to become children of God. If you uh, turn from your sins and embrace Christ, you're a child of God. He gave you the authority uh, to become a child of God. But then in verse 13, it's this same other side who are born not because of blood. It wasn't because of any kind of you know, good family that you came from. Nor was it the result of the will of the flesh. So a lot of people will say, oh, free will, free will. You know, God elects based on free will, but John says it wasn't because of the will of the flesh, nor was it the will of man, but these people were having been born from God. So here's a passage that takes both sides of the truth. Whosoever will, 
And God chooses, and it puts them in exactly the same sentence. So whatever this is talking about, and we're going to have to wrestle with this, it's, it's talking about a glorious idea, but it isn't a soundbite idea. Oh, well, you know, God's only going to save and no matter what you do. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says whosoever will. Uh, the Bible says if you believe, you will be saved. But the Bible also says this other side that somehow before the creation of the world that God is giving people to Jesus. So how do we bring these true, two truths together? And we're going to have to wrestle with it. We're going to look at what Paul says in Romans and what Paul says in Ephesians and other places. But uh, as we close out today, this is a great place for us to end. Uh, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but because I picked you out, I echelegoed you, um, I chose you out of the world, on account of this reason, the world hates you. Jesus says, just as the Father loved me, and in the Greek it's agape, just as the Father agape me, I have agape you. Abide in my love. Well, I can't imagine the depth of God's love for Jesus. And Jesus is saying, that same exact love is what I've loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. That's what I have for you today. I hope you have a good rest of the day, and I'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>